Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gareth Ellis, and I'm a developer at the, in the language services group at a company called Icon. Um, I'm also the lead organizer of the PHP Oxford user group. So uh, if you're ever in the Oxford area on the last Wednesday of the month, we'd love to see you there. So I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the solid principles. And I created this talk because I felt that it was content that I couldn't find when I was a relative novice to object-oriented programming. So the talk is pitched at those of you who have maybe heard of the solid principles and know vaguely what they are at a high level, but you're unsure of how you can actually apply them practically in your day-to-day, -day, and to those people who've never come across the solid principles at all. The solid principles are five guidelines for object-oriented design. Uh, they were first formulated in the late 90s uh, under the name The First Five Principles by a developer called Robert Martin, who some of you may know, may know as Uncle Bob. And then in the early 2000s, another developer called Michael Feathers came up with this acronym SOLID that we use uh, today to describe these principles together. And the idea is that when you apply all of the SOLID principles together to your code, it will result in code which is easier to maintain, easier to read, easier to extend, and easier to reason about. So what does reason about mean? Because I think when I first heard that phrase, I just assumed it meant understand. But I think it's subtly different from understanding. Code that we can understand is code that we can look at. We might have to ask a colleague to help explain what it does. We might have to go and read documentation. And after those steps, we might arrive at understanding the code. Whereas code that's easy to reason about is code that you can just look at, you can just understand it because it's self-explanatory, it's clear. And I think that's a really worthwhile goal of any code that we write. Solid principles are about object-oriented programming in general. They're not about PHP. We need to bear this in mind when we interpret the wording of these guidelines. When you're trying to apply solid to your work, the goal is not adherence to the goals themselves. There's no gold star. This achievement doesn't exist. As software developers, we should all know that every decision we make has a trade-off, or trade-offs, plural. And we need to be aware of what those trade-offs are at every point. And you may come across occasions when the trade-off for not applying solid to your work is worth it. And it's up to us to know those trade-offs and to be able to make informed decisions for our use cases. You will find that writing solid code means you are writing more code full stop. And I think this is OK, because as developers, we spend way more time reading code than we do writing. I think we can all relate to the idea of working on a problem, writing code, and being right in the headspace of that problem, right in that context, having all the information around us. And we write code, and then we come back to it a week later, and we look at it, and we go, well, I'm not really sure what I was doing there. That doesn't make sense to me. And that's because we've optimized for writing. We've optimized for saving a few keystrokes instead of making sure that our code is easy to read and easy to reason about. So on with the five principles. And the first of them, as you may guess, is the S. And that is the single responsibility principle, or SRP. SRP states that a class should have a single, well-defined purpose. Or more specifically, it has one reason to change. So what's a reason to change? Well, in my opinion, a reason to change is something which can possibly drive a change somewhere in your code. So for example, if you have a class which deals with talking to the database, the only reason for that class to change would be if you change something about the way you're talking to the database. So you're going to change a query, for example. Classes shouldn't get ideas above their station. A good rule of thumb is that you could try to define the purpose for your class in a single sentence without using the word and or or. And if you can't do that, your class might be doing too much. In my experience, and certainly in experience of applications that I have written in the past, uh, controllers in MVC applications tend to be quite big violators of this principle. So here's some code I have completely made up for the purposes of this talk, but hopefully it will seem familiar to some of you who have worked on applications of this type. Fairly common function for a lot of applications is to have a method for users to register. 
So here we have a user registration controller. It has a method called register, and we're passing in a request and a response object. So what's the controller's reason to change? Controller's concern should only really be with control flow. It's called a controller for a reason. The job of the controller is to take the request and return a response, and that might involve talking to the domain or the model or whatever you want to call it uh, in between. But it's very easy to stuff business logic into our controllers and make them bloated. So in this example, we've got uh, a user that we're creating from request data. We're making an entity. Uh, we're then going to save it in the database in the controller. So we've got some SQL in the middle of our controller. Uh, we're then going to send a welcome email to the user saying, hey, thanks for registering. And then we're going to return a response. So this controller has got several reasons to change right here, because it's dealing with logic to do with the database. It's dealing with logic to do with sending emails. And it's got to do its job as a controller as well. So the first step to refactoring this would be to move that logic into a separate class. So you could call this a service class, if you like. Um, I've named it user registration here. And what we're going to use this for is that instead of stuffing that logic into the controller, the controller will talk to this service class. So the controller knows, I am a controller method that is used when a user registers. I'm going to take the user, I'm going to pass it to the service class, and then I don't care what happens after that. It's none of my business. I'm a controller. So the service class will then deal with what needs to happen next. So here we've got the dependencies in the constructor for the database uh, dependency and the email dependency. And uh, we're assigning them to class properties. And then in the register method of the service class, which is the method that the controller will call, we can call uh, those same methods from the controller. Now, we can still do a little bit to improve this, because all we've done at the minute is copy and paste code from one class to another. This class uh, has more than one reason to change, because it's got logic to do with saving in the database, sending emails. So we could refactor that further. And we could move the logic to do with saving to the database to a separate class called user registration storage, for example, uh, and the email logic into another class called user registration welcome email. And once again, we assign those to class properties. And then we can call those in the register method. So now this class has fewer responsibilities. We could improve this further using, for example, the observer pattern. And that's something I'm going to briefly touch upon in the next section. Because the O in solid stands for the open and closed principle. Open and closed states that software entities, which we can think of as classes, should be open for extension, but closed for modification. That is, we need to be able to change the behavior of a class without editing its source code. Or you shouldn't need to cut your chest open just to put on a different coat. Closed for modification does not mean we should never, ever change source code. I think our jobs would be pretty difficult if that's what it meant. But just as a little uh, example, how many people here have had a class which is doing its job, it's working, it hasn't got any bugs that you know of, uh, and you have to change the functionality of it in some way. You have to change its behavior. So you make a change, and then you introduce a bug. Put your hand up. Yeah, quite a lot of people and some liars. <laughs> so changing code is a really common entry point for defects. Um, so if we can design up front for extension, design up front to anticipate ways in which we might need to use our code in the future, we can hopefully avoid having to make source code changes and avoid the likelihood of introducing bugs. On the other hand, there's always the chance that you ain't going to need it. So the trade-off here is, how do we work out what, in what ways our classes might need to be used in the future? And that takes experience, it takes practice, um, and you just need to kind of get an inkling and a, and a feeling for in what ways you might need to change things going forward. So it's a fine balance between not writing too much code and closing yourself off to uh, future, future extension. So open close states the classes should be open for extension. And what does that mean? When I first read this as a PHP developer, I immediately thought extension. That derives from the word extends, which is a keyword in PHP. It's what we use to create a subclass. So I thought, well, OK, that just means we need to be able to extend classes. It's inheritance, right? Open for extension means inheritance. But solid isn't about PHP. 
PHP does have the keyword extends. PHP has inheritance. But there are some object-oriented languages that don't. For example, Golang, I believe, doesn't have the classic inheritance model that PHP does. It has alternative ways you can get similar behavior, but it doesn't have that same approach built in. PHP itself has the final keyword. And when you uh, prefix final onto a class definition, nobody can extend that class. You can't subclass it. So the truth is that inheritance is just one tool available to us for ensuring our classes are open to extension. And like all tools, we need to know what strengths and weaknesses they have. Inheritance has its uses. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I don't use it, because I do. But you have to know your tools, like I say. But in general, we should try to favor composition over inheritance. Composition is one of the fundamental building blocks of object-oriented design. It's the idea that we can abstract things which vary between components of our applications and compose them into separate units or classes. So I've got an example for you of how composition might be better than inheritance in a certain situation. I've adapted this example from a really great book called Head First Design Patterns. I've got a link to it at the end of my slide. If you are not familiar with design patterns and you want to learn more about it, uh, I really, really recommend this book. It's a fantastic read. So uh, let's say we're working on a duck simulator app. Everyone likes ducks, right? Um, so in this simulator app, we're going to have a screen, and it's going to have ducks flying around on it and doing things that ducks do, like quacking and swimming and you know, duck things. So if we were to approach this using inheritance, we might do something like this. We might have an abstract class called duck, which has methods swim, quack, and fly. And in those methods, uh, we're going to have the logic concerned with actually performing those behaviors. So uh, we don't have real code here because it's not a real application, but hopefully you can use your imagination. And then we can add different types of duck to our application by extending the abstract class. So we can have a mallard and an ida and a mandarin and so on. Now, this works great, doesn't it? Because all ducks quack, fly, and swim. Then the boss says we need to put a rubber duck into our application. Oh, so we extend our duck abstract class. Um, ducks, rubber ducks don't swim. They just kind of float, bob on the water. So we have to override the parent method there. They don't quack either. They squeak when you squeeze them. So again, we have to override that parent method. And they don't fly. They don't have anything you could describe as flying unless throwing it across the room could be called flying. And of course, they have an additional behavior because they can help us debug our code. So we're finding ourselves having to override every method from our parent class, which is a bit of a sign that something's wrong with our design. Now, this might not be a big problem in this specific example, where we've only got four types. But as we scale our application, we're going to run into problems maintaining this. So say, let's say we have to also add a wooden toy duck to our application. This can have some similarities with a rubber duck, because it doesn't swim, uh, it doesn't quack, it doesn't make any noise at all, in fact, and it doesn't fly. So again, we're overriding methods from the parent class. We're having to duplicate code. Uh, we're going to run into problems scaling this, because we're going to have behavior code spread about different classes, and it's going to get messy. So if we were to approach this problem using composition, we might do something like this. Let's say we create interfaces called swimming, with a method swim, quacking, with a method quack, and flying, with a method fly. We're going to encapsulate the thing which varies between the ducks, which is the way that they perform these behaviors. And we're going to compose those behaviors into their own classes. These interfaces will not be implemented by the duck classes. They will be implemented by classes which, uh, whose job, whose single responsibility, is to perform those behaviors. By doing this, we also make our ducks more compliant with single responsibility principle, because the duck classes are no longer concerned with how they fly, swim, or quack. So we might implement this something like this. We've got the interface quacking, for example. Uh, we'll have a quacking duck behavior, which the regular ducks can use. that will make a normal quack noise. We'll have a mute duck for the uh, wooden duck. And we're going to have a squeaking duck for the rubber duck. And then it might look something like this. So we've got the Ida duck class, whose constructor would look something like this. And if you look in the constructor here, we can see we've got type hints on those behavior interfaces, swimming, quacking, and flying. So we inject in instances of those behaviors, assign them to class properties, 
And then in the methods, the swim, quack, and fly methods on the duck class, we just delegate to those behaviors. So what does this have to do with the open and closed principle? Our duck classes are now open to extension because these type hints in the constructor here are interfaces. So we can pass in alternative behaviors if we want and change the way that this duck behaves. Now, Ida ducks are a particular favorite of mine because they have a really cool mating noise. Kind of sounds like this. Let's say some users of our application want uh, Ida ducks, instead of quacking, to make the noise that I can't believe I just made on stage in front of a couple hundred people, um, we might create a class called oo, which implements our quacking interface and it would take care of the logic of making that ridiculous sound. And then we can inject that into the IDADUCK class by passing it in in the constructor. So we've changed its behavior without having to change its source code. It's open for extension. And that approach is a pattern which is known as the strategy pattern, very common pattern you'll come across, very powerful way of changing behaviors by passing in different implementations of interfaces. Another way that we can keep our classes open to extension is to use something called the decorator pattern. I like to think of the decorator pattern as a bit like sandwiches. I like sandwiches. The decorator pattern is, I'll rewind slightly. Imagine you go into a shop like Pret a Manger or Tesco or somewhere where they sell prepackaged sandwiches and you take one out of the fridge and you take it home. That, that sandwich is closed for modification effectively because if you want to change the sandwich, let's say you bought chicken and mayonnaise and you don't like mayonnaise, you've got to open the sandwich, you've got to scrape the mayonnaise off the bread. It's not going to be very good, is it? Whereas if you go to somewhere like Subway, they have this kind of production line process. You go up and you'd say, I'd like a, a wheat bread roll with chicken in it, please. And then they pass it along their production line and at each stage of that production line, you can choose whether you want to decorate your sandwich with salad or sauce or cheese or whatever it might be. So Subway sandwiches are effectively open for extension. And they, you don't have to like send, go all the way back to the start and start again if you decide that you want mayonnaise in your sandwich. So that's the decorator pattern, effectively. I've got a real example for you. Um, but has anyone in here uh, done any implementing of PSR7 middleware in something like Slim or Symphony or something like that? OK, well, if, if you've done that, that's the decorator pattern, effectively. This idea of passing in request and response objects down a chain, the middleware stack, and operating on those objects. And when you get to the other end of the chain, those objects will have changed. They will have been decorated. So here is a real example adapted from something we did at work. So our, one of our applications had to integrate with a third-party API. And that API uses OAuth2 for its authentication. So every time we hit an API endpoint to request some data or post something or whatever we're doing, we have to send a valid OAuth2 to token. Tokens from this API were, were valid for 48 hours. And we were going to be making multiple requests to this API every day. So to us, it didn't make sense to just request a new token every time we were going to hit the API. We could store an existing token for 48 hours and reuse it. So we realized we could achieve this using the decorator pattern. So the first and key step to a decorator pattern is having some common interface that your classes can implement and that you can chain together. So in this case, it was called access token repository. And it has a single method called get, which returns an access token. So this will represent somewhere where client code can call this get method and get an access token object back. That's its contract. So we then made a class called API repository. And this will be a class that we use to get a new access token from the API. So in the constructor of this class, we pass in uh, an instance of a class called provider, which came from the PHP League of Extraordinary Packages OAuth2 client. Really great library if you want to work with OAuth2, by the way. Uh, we assign that to a class property. And then in the get method, we can just delegate to that provider class and call the get access token because we know that that will give us an access token object. Now, if we want to store that token, we could, of course, go back and change this and put storage logic into that code. But for a start, that's not making our code's not going to be very flexible. 
If we ever want to take the storage logic out, we've got to change its source code, so it would be open for modification. We'd also be adding additional responsibilities. This class is really simple, because all it cares about is getting a token from the API. We shouldn't be adding additional responsibilities to it. So, according to the decorator approach, we make a new implementation of our access token repository interface. So here it's called storage repository, and this will represent somewhere where we can, we can get an access token from a store of some kind, whether that's a database or file system or Redis or whatever you like. And in its constructor, it has two dependencies. One is token storage, which is another interface we created. Um, I don't have it on the slides, but hopefully you can imagine what it might look like. Um, and that will just be something which will represent talking, that, that will deal with you know, talking to whatever store you're using. So if you're using a database, that would, be, that would contain PDO and some queries or whatever. Um, and then the other uh, dependency you can see on the second line of the constructor signature is another instance of access token repository. And the eagle eyed of you will notice that access token repository in the constructor signature is the same type as in the implement statement at the top of the class. So what this means is we can ask the storage repository to get us a token from its store. We can check whether it's valid or not. And if it's not valid, we can call that other repository instance we passed in as a fallback method. So in our case, we're saying check the database for a storage, uh, for, check the database for a token. And if we don't have one, we're going to call the next decorator, which in our case will just be the API repository. And in this case, after we've called it, we've got the token back. The storage uh, dependency can then save the token in our database again, so that next time we hit it, it will be there and valid, and then we can return it. The important point to note is that this, in, in, uh, this instance of access token repository that we pass in could be any implementation we like. So if we want to add additional decorators to our chain, we can do that. So here's what the usage of that code would look like. We have to instantiate a few different things. Uh, and wire things together. This is an example of solid, meaning we're having to write a bit of code. We have put, solid tends to put the burden on the calling code. Uh, and this is an, an example of that, because we've got to set up all the dependencies. And then th what I think is really nice and really simple is that the client code, OK, it does have to deal with wiring together these dependencies, but then it can just call one method, and it gets a token back. And it doesn't need to know anything about what's happening underneath that. It doesn't know that there's any decorator pattern involved there. It doesn't know that it's, whether it's getting a token from storage or from the API. It doesn't care. It doesn't need to know. So if we wanted to add an additional decorator here, let's say if we wanted to log every time we were hitting the API to request uh, an access token, we could add a new implementation of our repository and sandwich that in between. Uh, the different layers of our decorator setup. The final um, pattern I want to briefly mention, I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into any detail on this, uh, is the observer pattern. And this is another way you can keep your classes open for extension. If we think back to that controller example where we'd refactored out into a service class, we could make that class more open to extension by using the observer pattern. Um, all I can say is this is a really interesting and useful pattern. If you've ever used um, frameworks, event subsystems, they tend to use a version of the observer pattern. And uh, there's some really great articles out there that you can go away and read. Uh, I would recommend that. There's a good section in that book as well that I mentioned before. So we're on to the L of solid. <clears throat> which is the Liskov substitution principle. Uh, Liskov substitution principle was uh, formulated by a woman called Barbara Liskov. She was quite an awesome lady. She was the first woman in the US, I'm going to get this right, to get a doctorate in computer science. And her uh, principle states that objects in a program should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of that program. Or if S is a subtype of T, then objects of type T in a program may be replaced with objects of type S without altering the desirable properties of that program. Everything seems to come back to ducks. So when I read that wording and I see things like uh, correctness, uh, desirable properties, that says to me it's all about behavior. So here's an example of a Liskov substitution breach. 
This comes from Uncle Bob himself. He wrote an article about LSP, uh, which is really interesting. I won't un pretend to understand it all. It's quite academic in places, but it's a very interesting read anyway. So let's suppose we have an application which deals with geometric shapes. And we have a class called rectangle, which is going to represent a rectangle. And a rectangle has a height and a width, and we need to be able to set and get those. Uh, this isn't a very good class. It's completely mutable and so on. But let's just ignore that for this example. Um, <clears throat> we then have a function called transform, which, again, I'm not really sure why it would exist in the real world. But here we go, just serves. Uh, good, serves the purpose of this example. And when you pass in a rectangle to this function, it's going to change the height of the rectangle to 10. So we'd instantiate a rectangle, give it a height and width, and then we'd call our transform method, transform function. The idea would be that if we check the height and the width of the rectangle after we've called transform, the height will have changed, but the width will have stayed the same. That is the desirable property of the rectangle class. Right? The transform function, when it calls set height, it doesn't expect anything to happen to the width. So let's say in our application, as well as a rectangle, we also need to have a square. Now, squares in mathematics and geometry are inarguably a type of rectangle. So we should be able to just subclass a rectangle, right? Create a square like that. So let's do that. Let's see what that looks like. So here's our square class. Uh, now, squares, the, the fundamental property of a square is that its height and width are always the same. So we can get rid of the height and width properties from rectangle and replace it with a single height and width property. Uh, we then have to override the setters and the getters to deal with the different property. And once again, as with the duck example before, the fact that we're overriding all of those methods is a sign that there's something wrong with our design. But here's the problem. When we pass in a square to the, rectangle, to the transform function, which PHP will allow us to do, because our rectangle type hint here will allow us to pass in a subtype, like square, and it's called set height, the height will have changed, but so will the width. So from the point of view of the consumer of the rectangle type, which is our transform function, this is performing undesirable things, unexpected things. Who's heard of a concept called design by contract? A few of you, OK. Um, really interesting topic. It's worthy of many talks uh, by itself. But there's a good Wikipedia article if you want to get an overview on it. Uh, there's also a couple of RFCs in discussion at the minute, I think, for adding native design by contract features to PHP, which could be interesting. And in his article, anyway, in his article, Uncle Bob talks about a strong correlation between LSP, between Liskov substitution principle, and design by contract. And one of the things that design by contract talks about is the idea of preconditions and postconditions. So if we could have a look at what that might look like for our rectangle class, the precondition of our set height method could be, for example, there is a rectangle and it has a given height and width. The post condition of the set height method, what we would expect to be the case after we've called it, would be the height of the rectangle has changed, but the width has not. So this is a useful approach for assessing the substitutability of subclasses. We can come up with these pre and post conditions, and we can write tests to assert whether we are meeting those conditions. In general, I think the square and rectangle example is another illustration of the problems that can be introduced by inheritance. I would go back to the point I made before about favoring composition. And I think LSP pushes us towards composition and away from inheritance. The I in solid stands for interface segregation principle. An interface segregation principle, or ISP, states that many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. No client should be forced to depend on methods it doesn't use. You can think of it as breaking down larger interfaces into smaller ones, smaller and more specific ones. <clears throat> 
Uncle Bob first formulated ISP when he was contracting at Xerox in the late 90s. Uh, Xerox obviously make these big corporate uh, printers and photocopiers, you know, all in one type things. And the software that was running on these had uh, this concept of jobs. So you had a print job and a, t and a, a copy job, a fax job, etc. And apparently this software had one big interface called job, which had you know, print method, a copy method, that sort of thing. It was, it was big. And every time they wanted to make changes to their software, it was getting harder and harder because they had this tight dependency on this class, which wasn't, sorry, this type, which wasn't specific enough for their use case. So before I go into an example, um, I'd also like to mention another talk specifically about ISP. Obviously, in a talk about all of the solid principles, I can only talk for so long about each individual one. Um, there's a guy called Dan Aykroyd who did a really good talk about this at PHP Northwest last year. Uh, the video's not online yet, but the slides are, so I've got a link to those. And obviously, he goes into a bit more depth than, than I can about this in this time. So <clears throat> here's an example of ISP at work literally at work. This is uh, adapted from something real we did. So at the end of last year, we were working on an application which had pages, which had lists of things on it. So we had things like lists of users, lists of clients, lists of projects, that kind of thing. And some of these pages were going to be, you know, they're going to be lo loads and loads and loads of items, hundreds of items. So users needed a way to filter those lists and find what was actually interesting to them, what they needed to, to use. So we had to include various search options at the top of each page. So we had types like drop down. So uh, if we wanted to search for projects for a certain client, we'd have a select box with the client names in them. Uh, free text. So if we wanted to search by project name, we'd have a free text field. And date ranges. So if they wanted to find projects created within a certain date range, there'd be a couple of date pickers that they could use. So we decided the way that we could implement this would be to use our friend the decorator pattern and the composite pattern. And we created this interface called filter. And the idea would be that each of those types of filter, date range, free text, drop down, et cetera, would have its own implementation of this interface. Um, and we'd additionally have a collection class, which would bundle all of the filters together uh, so that they could be used together. So this interface it has a method called build query from, which has two, um, two dependencies. One which is a request, which is cake PHP's HTTP request object. Uh, and the idea would be that when a user filled in the form, it would submit it, and the data they had posted would be populated in the query string. And we could grab their search data from the query string. So request, the request object in cake PHP has a query method. So we can just grab uh, what's coming from the query string using that query method. The other dependency is slightly confusingly called query. This is a different kind of query. Uh, this comes from Cake PHP's ORM. So this is a database query. And the idea would be that for each filter, we can look at what the user has actually searched for and decide whether we need to adjust our database query accordingly. So here's what the filter collection would look like. Uh, we have a method add, where we can add filters in. And then in the build query from implementation, we can loop over each of those filters that we've added. We can decorate the query object by passing it in along with the request. Each filter will operate it on in turn, and eventually we'll get back a query object which will have all the right where conditions and joins or whatever we need to do the search for what the user has searched for. So here's an example of an implementation of an individual filter class. This one's the free text. So we pass in. Uh, the table alias and the field name. So for example, blog posts, table, and uh, we're searching on the field title, we'd pass in blog posts and title. And then in the build query from method, first of all, we have to check, uh, does, does this field exist in the query string? So if request query this field name, we're basically saying, query string, do you have the field that we're interested in, which in the example I just gave would be title. So we'd be saying, does the query string have a key title, and if so, what's the value? If it does have it, then we'll be able to decorate the query object by changing the where conditions. So here, we're just adding a like condition for our SQL. And then finally, we're going to return the query back so that the next 
um, part of the chain can decorate the query and so on. So the usage is really simple, really neat. This is what it looks like. Just add our new free text into the collection like that. But then we hit a bug after we deployed. And the bug was, what if the user searches for zero? We had a very um, specific use case where a user was searching for zero, and it was valid. Now, because this was our if statement, obviously PHP will evaluate a string of zero as false. So this conditional check failed, and the search wasn't working. So essentially what we needed to do is change this. So instead of just saying to the query, you know, falsy, is this true, see, or falsy, we have to more specifically ask it, does this key exist, i.e., is it null? And if it does exist, does it have, does it have a value, does it, or is it just an empty string? So we started changing all of our filter classes to have something that looked like this. And as I was doing this, I just thought to myself that this doesn't feel right. This feels pretty grotty. And the reason for that is that this is a leaky abstraction. Our filter classes shouldn't know anything about the way that CakePHP's request class deals with the concept of keys existing in the query string. And this all boils down to the fact that our filter class has a dependency on the request object, and that is not specific enough a type for our use case. So the way that we approached this and fixed it was we, we created a new interface called search parameters. And we changed the signature of the filters to depend on the search parameters interface instead. And as you can see, the search parameters type, uh, search parameters interface has two methods, has, which returns a bool, and value, which returns the value of the thing in the query string if it's there. We can still use CakePHP's request object. We can still use the query string. But instead, we can now wrap that up inside this search parameters implementation. So here's what that would look like. We inject the request object in the constructor. Our has method wraps up that slightly grotty logic about the implementation details of CakePHP's uh, handling of query strings. So now that's hidden away. We don't have to worry about it. And then we have a value method, which just returns from the query method, as we were doing before. The revised filters look like this. This reads so much better, so much more nicely than either of the previous two versions, which directly depended on the request object. It reads like plain English, doesn't it? This is something we strive for in our work, is to try and write code which reads as much like plain English as we can. So instead of dealing with the internals of Cake PHP, it's now just dealing with a nice interface which is very specific to what it needs to do. Benefits here of adhering to interface segregation, uh, our classes are more loosely coupled. Uh, we've given our filter classes one less reason to change because it's no longer concerned with internal implementation details of, of the framework. And our filter class itself has moved towards being open to extension because it's dependent on a very specific interface. So if we want to change the way that we are sending in those search parameters, let's say we want to use post instead of a query string, or we want to use JSON data on an API call, or even if we want to make a command line tool, we can just create new in implementations of our interface. As PHP developers, I think it's easy for us to read the definition of the interface segregation principle and think of an interface like this one. Right? An interface is a thing in PHP. It's an abstract type. It's a way of um, providing a contract for our classes. But Ruby, for example, is an object-oriented language, fully object-oriented. Everything in the language in Ruby is an object. A string is just an object which has methods you can call. Arrays, Booleans, the same. But Ruby, being more object-oriented than PHP, doesn't have interfaces, doesn't have this. So how would a Ruby developer interpret ISP if they don't have a thing called interfaces? And the truth is that all classes 
have an interface, even if they don't explicitly implement one. So if we go back to the IDA class from earlier, I'm not going to make the noise again, don't worry. Um, you can see that at the top there, there's no implements keyword. It's not explicitly implementing an interface, but it does have an interface. And its interface is just its public methods and their signature, which would look something like this. So this interface doesn't exist, but you can, you know, it's kind of an abstract idea. It's out there. So we can take this idea, and it leads really nicely into a point that Dan made in his talk, which is that ISP, in, for PHP developers in particular, isn't really about interfaces, but it's about types. And he summed it up really well with a slide that looked a lot like that. So let's quickly review what types are. Um, Wikipedia helpfully tells us that a type is a classification of data which tells the compiler how the programmer intends to use the data. So in PHP, we've got uh, complex types and we have scalar types. Now, I've slightly adapted that division because I think it fits this example more nicely. So I'm going to say PHP has objects and it has everything else. So in PHP, we have two types of object, really. We have abstract types and we have concrete types. So abstracts would be interfaces and abstract classes, and concretes are anything that you can put the new keyword in front of and actually instantiate an instance of. So we've seen examples of interfaces like filter, abstract classes like duck, various concrete classes throughout this talk. And um, free text, for example, is, uh, is a class which is of type free text, but it's also a subtype of filter, so it is a type filter as well. So in the other column in PHP, we have scalars and arrays. Arrays are technically in the complex type category, which is why I've had to adapt this slightly. Uh, and I think there's some others that aren't on the list there that I've missed out. But hopefully you get the, the general point. In PHP, we have objects which have methods that we can call, and then we have other types. In other languages like Ruby that I mentioned and Scala, for example, they are fully object-oriented languages. So everything in the language is an object that you can instantiate and then call methods on, even strings, bools, ints, etc. So if we were programming in Scala, for example, and we had a class which was dependent on an array, or a class which returned an array as a result of one of its methods, it wouldn't be returning an array like we think of it in PHP, as this kind of giant bucket that we can throw anything into. It would be returning an object of type array with methods. So if we go back to the point I made before, that interface segregation is about type specificity. That's a hard word to say. Type specificity. Um, then we can say, well, if we're depending on an array, an array has an interface, because it's a class, and all classes have interfaces, we need to ask ourselves, is the interface of the class array specific enough for our use case? So that's what ISP is all about. So we don't have that luxury in PHP. We don't have these super amazing objects for everything. But we can still apply that logic. And arrays, as I said, they're, they're just this big bucket in PHP. They're this Swiss army knife of programming that we can use and abuse to do whatever we want. Um, and I would contend that maybe we shouldn't do that sometimes. So it's quite a common pattern to see arrays used for holding configuration values or options. So this is adapted from another real example we did at work. And we had a date picker uh, method on our form helper. And the job of this method would be to render uh, a date picker on a form. Right? Pretty straightforward functionality, pretty common functionality. And we had um, two uh, arguments to the method, one which was called field name, which would just be the field name in the HTML and then options, which would allow us to configure on the fly things like um, the CSS classes or um, whether it's a required field or not, change the text label, that sort of thing. The problem with doing it like this is that in the class itself, in the, in the method body, we've got to have code like this to check each option. We've got to check whether the key exists in the array or not, and then we've got to check the actual value of it. It doesn't read very nicely. It's pretty boring to type. Um, it's also pretty prone to errors, particularly from the point of view of the calling code. So here in this example, in the calling code, I've deliberately misspelled is required field. When I run that code, I'm not going to get any error message. 
So the only time I'm going to realize it's not working is when I notice that the code's not doing what I want, and then I've got to start debugging and trying to work out why. And trying to spot this kind of thing is a massive pain, as I'm sure you are aware. We've also got no auto-completion support. I'm a pretty lazy coder. I really lean on my IDE and its auto-completion support. So I always want to have it wherever I can. So instead of using an array, we could use uh, an object. We could use a class. So we, we made a class called date picker options. And then we can define each of the options we want in that class. So for example, is required field, which will default to false. And then we can turn that to true and false using set required field. And we have a getter method called is required field, which just returns the value of it. So by doing it like this, we add some constraints to our options as well. Because now this can only be a Boolean, whereas before, someone, if they wanted to, could assign anything they like into that array. But now it has to be a Boolean, because we've got type hint support. Likewise, for the label, which is a string, um, we can add additional validation to it, because we've got a setter method. So if, for some bizarre reason, we wanted to make sure that our label was no longer than 25 characters, we can do that. And we get autocomplete support. Hooray. So this is what the revised version would look like. We pass in a date picker options instance instead of the array. Uh, the method body now looks much nicer. It's easier to read, easier to reason about. You can look at that line, if options is required field, and you know exactly what it means. You don't have to try and parse array type stuff to work it out. And our calling code looks nicer as well. It's more uh, declarative, it's, more, it's easier to to understand its, its expressive code. We can apply that logic to other primitive types as well. This isn't technically connected to ISP, but um, I think it's quite a nice little um, tip. <laughs> uh, it's quite common to see functions or method, call, or method signatures which have lots of booleans for enabling or disabling certain things. Um, so this is adapted from something I've seen in the wild. So let's say this function is a, effectively a factory for an instance of connection. And you're going to call it, and it will give you a connection. The problem here is that when we call the code, we've then got this horrendous line of booleans. When you go and look at that code in a week, after you've forgotten what each of those mean, you're going to look at that and go, of course, right, it's, yeah, it's starting to connect with a true, false, true, right? I mean, it's not so bad here because we've got the function definition right above the function call, but in reality, you're not going to have that. So this is really hard to reason about this code. So sometimes, you know, you might be working with a third-party library which has a, fun, you know, a method function signature like that, um, and there's nothing you can actually do to improve it, but what you can do is you can wrap around it, you can, you can adapt. So you could approach this problem using uh, the builder pattern. So if we created a class called connection factory, and we pass in whatever we need as dependencies, and then we have methods called enable persist and disable persist, and those are just going to toggle the persist value between true and false. They're setters, effectively, but we haven't used the word set in the method name because it reads nicer. Uh, and each of those methods, you'll notice, will return an instance of the same class because we can then use fluent method chaining for making nice readable code. Now, there are other options in that function uh, signature that we had on the previous screen. We've got persist, enable awesomeness, disable flux capacitor. Um, I haven't been able to fit them all on this screen, but you have to imagine that they're there as well. They've got a property and that they've got enable and disable methods as well. Then the most important part of this class is this function at the bottom, the get connection. So that's the part that wraps that original connect with those nasty booleans, which are so hard to read. So we can wrap that function call in this method, and we're hiding the implementation detail of those booleans inside this class. So now our calling class, instead of calling the function, can create a connection factory, use its fluent interface, call the methods, and set whatever things we want to do and then call get connection. This is many, many times nicer to read and easier to reason about than the function call. But yeah, we had to write more code, which, as I said, is something you find you have to do more of when you're writing better code. So um, 
the final solid principle, and the D, is dependency inversion. Dependency inversion principle states that we should depend on abstractions, not concretions. Who has heard of dependency injection? Good, quite a lot of hands. <laughs> um, dependency inversion, or the dependency inversion principle, is what we're trying to address when we use dependency injection. So when we say a class depends on abstractions, not concretions, we're talking about a class's dependencies, the things it needs to get its job done. We've seen several examples of dependencies throughout this talk, and here's one of them. So here's the Ida class, going back to it again, all comes back to ducks, it seems. And this time I have adapted the constructor, and I have removed the type hints and the arguments from its signature. So instead of passing in its dependencies, we're going to instantiate them in place. So we're assigning our behavior classes, swimming duck, quacking duck, and flying duck, to properties by using new. So this class is now dependent on concretions because they are, if you like, concreted in place. If we want to change the behaviors, we have to change the source code, right? Which, as we've seen in open closed, is something we want to try and avoid. So we could adapt it and change it back to something like this, where in the constructor we're passing in uh, arguments, uh, we've got type hints, and then we're assigning them to properties inside the constructor body. But what I want to note here is that in this example, we've got swimming duck, quacking duck, and flying duck as the type hints. Those are not the interfaces we created earlier. Those are the concrete classes. Those are things which can be instantiated with new. And indeed, we saw that on the previous slide. But this class is now dependent on abstractions, even though it's dependent on concrete classes. Because from the point of view of this class, it doesn't know what swimming duck, quacking duck, and flying duck are. It doesn't know that they're concrete classes or whether they're interfaces. It just knows that they are types with methods that it can depend on. So if we want to change you know, swimming duck into an interface, for example, at a later time, we can do that, and we don't have to change this class. So dependency injection and, depend and managing dependency inversion principle is not necessarily about using interfaces. Like I said, we could change those concrete classes to be abstractions, to be uh, abstract classes or interfaces if we wanted to in the future. But the point is the choice is now ours. It's not hardwired into that other class because it's dependent on abstract concepts. I think we've seen plenty of good examples in this talk of the value encoding to interfaces. But DI does not mean you always have to do it. As always, evaluate the pros and cons of each approach and make the appropriate choice for your use case. Dependency inversion is not necessarily about objects either. Go back to my examples of Ruby and Scala as languages which are fully object-oriented. You could have a class which depends on strings or booleans or whatever. And in those languages, it, they're still depending on objects. Just in PHP, they're not. They're not objects, they're scalars. So let's have uh, an example. We have a class called MySQL Connection Factory. And in the constructor, we have the username and password for connecting to the database. These are concrete strings. This class is dependent on concretions because we can't change those strings without modifying the the class. It's in breach of OCP, and it's in breach of dependency inversion. A change of credentials requires a change in the source code. So just like using dependency injection for objects, we can inject strings in from the outside as well. And here's what this would look like. We just change the constructor to pass in the values from the outside. And now it's up to us where we store those values. We can put them wherever we want. We can put them in a settings file. We could put them in uh, environment variables. It's up to us. I said before that solid tends to put more burden onto the calling code. And I think this is a good, DI is a good example of that. So you can see like the bad version where we're, we're not using dependency injection and we're dependent on concretions. It's two words and a semicolon. But with dependency injection, we're having to do more. We're having to wire stuff together. We're having to instantiate things um, and hook everything up. 
This is where a dependency injection container can help you. So there's several examples of uh, DI containers in PHP. They include uh, Pimple, Orin, uh, PHP DI, Zen Service Manager, uh, there's loads of others. Um, if you want to know more about those, I would recommend going and reading their documentation. Um, they're very powerful tools, DI containers. Um, the trade-off of using them, in my experience, is that it can make your code flow a little harder to follow, a little harder to reason about, because you take the logic of wiring things together and you put it somewhere else that you've then got to go and look if you want to kind of work out and debug what's going on. Um, it's, I think, simplification through obfuscation. And it's a little bit like tidying your house by throwing everything into the cupboard under the stairs. You just moved the burden somewhere else. So DIC, DI containers are a really useful tool for managing dependency injection. But you don't have to use one to do dependency injection. And you don't have to use one to comply with the dependency inversion principle either. Nearly there. You've got one more keynote, and then we can go to the party. So in summary, here are a few points that I ended up writing down after doing the research and uh, writing this talk. We spend more time reading our code than writing, and so we should optimize for reading. We should keep our classes small, specialized, and simple, because doing that means our classes are easier to maintain, easier to extend, easier to refactor. We should favor composition over inheritance, but realize that inheritance is a tool that has its uses just like any other. We should make our types as specific as we can and use arrays sparingly. Let's not just throw arrays into everything. We need to create dependencies on the outside and pass them in and use interfaces when they're useful. Finally, we need to always know our trade-offs, know our tools, know the pros and cons, and be able to make the right decisions for our use cases. Thank you very much. I've been Gareth Ellis. This was my first conference talk, so I would really appreciate any feedback you can leave on Joined In. Uh, I will tweet uh, the slides in a little while, which will have all of these handy links in if you want to go and read any more about it. Um, and that is it. We got time for questions? I think we've got time for one question, if anyone's got any. Where can I find more information on this? About solid or all yeah, the slides or whatever. Um, Wikipedia's got a good start, solid, and then there's an article about each individual principle, and there's loads of blog posts where people have written their interpretations of the rules. Um, the headfirst design patterns talks about each design pattern, quite a lot of them, it says this will help you meet this guideline, and it references solid and stuff, so that's another really good resource. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.